Greetings, ruffians. What you're about to listen to is an excerpt, just a little taste of the audiobook for Mark of the Witchworm, an upcoming dark fantasy novel brought to you directly by those psychos over at Rough House Publishing. Menace Morgrig looked up from where he sat, resting in his tent. Men were shouting. His men. They sounded panicked, frightened. Standing, he reached for the knife that usually weighed down his belt. The scabbard was there, but empty. It took a second before he remembered where he had left it. No, it's not possible. Even if that bastard managed to cut himself free, he wouldn't come here. No man would do that. At least no sane man. What could he possibly hope to gain? Morgrig glanced at the saddlebags that sat on the table where he typically dined alone. He hadn't looked inside them yet. Something outside popped. A shrill, jarring sound like the initial clap of thunder before it started rolling away. Hissing an inward curse, Morgrig stormed out of his tent with sword in hand. The world outside was filled with smoke and chaos, but mostly smoke. The campfire billowed a pillar of ash-colored liquid, only it wasn't liquid. Nor was it the usual sort of smoke produced by a usual fire. Flash! Crack! Unlike the first, the latest crack sounded as if it were made up of many smaller ones, as if someone had thrown a handful of black powder into the flames. Morgrig's hand flew to his eyes, but it was too late. He had to fight through searing pain to keep them open. Through a blur of tears, he could see more of the strange smoke. Now two rivers of the stuff were pouring out of his campfire. Smoke didn't do that. Nothing did. Voss! roared the Red Wolf. Dirk! Slogter! The hell is going on here? Menace! came a voice he could not place. We're under attack, sir! Someone is... Ah! Morgrig clawed the tears away from his eyes, battling to see something, anything, Then he wished he hadn't. There were ghosts in the smoke, silhouettes and shades. They moved in and out of existence, stretching into shapes that no man could make. Snakes. This was his first thought. And then... Ropes? Whipping, lashing about the inside of the smoke. It was ludicrous, but he could see them, growing, looping over one another as they assaulted his men. He could see neither heads nor tails, but the panicked shouts assured Morgrig that he had not gone mad. Whatever this was, it was actually happening. Bellowing with rage, Morgrig lashed out at the things in the smoke. His blade sliced through coils and lengths of the phantom ropes. A pain punctured up his arm. Bitten, his mind screamed, but wrongly. When he looked, he saw a length of thorny vine there, wrapping around his arm. With a cry of disgust, he ripped the coiling thing away, leaving a bloody track on the exposed flesh. Not ropes, he realized. Vines! The injured tendril wasted no time in attempting to insinuate itself around the hand that gripped it, but Morgrig acted in time. Hurling it to the ground, he slashed until only green pulp and thorns remained. The man turned, every inch of him a wild, raw nerve. The smoke was thick, but through it shadows flickered, silhouettes of more parasitic vines, undulating, cracking like liquid whips. They were in the air and on all sides, and as far as Morgrig could tell, he was the only one who wasn't screaming. All of this, somehow it had to be the work of the man in the hood, the one he'd taunted and left to a most horrible death. Maybe the man had been some sort of wizard, but somehow, somewhere deep in his gut, Morgrig knew it could be no one else. You! Morgrig's voice was ragged, unhinged. You not catch me in a snare! You hear me, Roseman? I'll find you! I'll find you, and by God, I'll tear you apart! There! Someone was rushing towards him through the smoke! The silhouette was indistinct, but at the last second he saw a telltale flap of cloak. Baring his teeth, the red wolf thrust out a fist. The attack contained all the will to shatter stone, but only smoke felt its wrath. In frustration he roared, following with a furious horizontal slash of his broad, twice-edged sword. The second attack fared better, and his opponent went down. Following this there came a herking, gurgling sputter that sounded a little 
like music. Voss! called Morgrig into the chaos. Oi, Voss, you hear me? The brigand stood over his victim, glaring with triumphant bloodshot eyes. He waved a hand, but the smoke would not be dismissed. His eyes burned and stung, but he fought to keep them open. Morgrig needed to see the dead man, the face of the son of a bitch who dared attack him in his own camp. Fucking smoke! He shouted, Voss, get your ass over here! With that, Morgrig began to cough. Only a single bark at first, but quickly the fit doubled the man over. From behind rang a shout. Someone else was rushing through the smoke. Morgrig spun, lashing out with every bit of force he had left. His sword clanged, sending reverberations up through his arm. Jolted, Morgrig recognized the shadow of a beaked mask, the one worn by his so-called butcher. Uh, Slogged her! The beaked face gave a nod. A smile pulled at the corner of Morgrig's lips, and slowly the shouts of his men returned to his awareness. More than a dozen panicked voices had melded into a single sound, like the drone of panicked wasps. Of the two torrential rivers of smoke that had flowed so improbably from the campfire, only a lone tendril now trickled. Suppressing a fresh cough, Morgrig looked down. The dead man's face was almost visible. Again he tried to wave the smoke away, but it was persistent stuff, swirling back into place almost immediately. It was all so damned confusing. Using his shirt, the red wolf wiped at his eyes. God, how they burned. All around, more and more shapes were appearing, slowly becoming men he knew, men he commanded, men whose bodies were now horribly bent and constricted. He wanted to count them, but his eyes kept slamming shut, each time with a new burst of pain. Plague of whores! Voss! he shouted into the chaos. It's Dirk, sir, answered a voice. Thank the gods you're still alive. Never mind that. Where is Voss? Don't know, sir. Hard to see anything in this. What the hell happened? growled Manus Morgrig. Haven't seen him since the first flash. We was lying about, waiting for the horse to cook, when all of a sudden there was this bang like thunder, and then came the smoke, uh, the smoke and the... The vines, Morgrig frowned. I can see that, Dirk. Got the bastard that did this, too. Got him right here. He looked at the man on the ground. His pallid face was almost visible. But, sir, objected Dirk, begging your pardon, but our attacker, uh, he, he ran off. He what? The red wolf shot an angry glare at his man. Dirk nodded nervously. Saw him myself, sir. Son of a whore was wearing a long cloak with a hood. Think it was that guy we left for the rose. Morgrig felt like his insides were about to boil. He looked back down, finally able to see the pale man on the ground who wore a look of surprise. In a pool of blood lay Alberg Voss, Morgrig's most dependable lieutenant, still dressed in his long jacket. A single horrific slash to his neck gaped, like a slanted second mouth. Morgrig was transfixed by the wound, confounded by it. For a few moments he could only watch the gushes of red empty out of the man, pulsing in a series of slow heaves. Sir? The questioning voice belonged to the man called Dirk, a northerner neither the mental nor physical match for the man on the ground. His hair hung in long greasy strands, and there were eight red lines painted on his face, four on each side. Menace? Hearing his name, Morgrig looked up, inhaling a cold draft in through his nostrils. He scanned the camp. The smoke had cleared enough to reveal a scene no less grisly than the one at his feet. His pack of wolves was bloodied, broken. A half-dozen bodies, some squirming, some still, were strewn about the camp. They were thoroughly wrapped in coils of thorny green ropes that all had the same origin point. From the still raging fire, flickering like an apparition in the flames, was a horrendous bulging mass, a tangle of unburnt vines that approximated a sort of body. From this, the rest of the tendrils had grown, and it was to this that the man-sized pods were giving the contents of their veins. How could this have happened? 
Borgrig's mind raced. How could something so monstrous have grown so impossibly fast? There were no answers to these questions. His bleary, groggy eyes settled upon a single perfect flower growing from the tangled mass. The petals slowly peeled and spread to reveal a center as red as blood. It looked like the inside of a heart, and like a heart, it was beating. It was too much. Something snapped inside the red wolf of the North Woods. Morgrig threw back his head and howled. The sound traveled far, coursing with anguish and with mindless, bestial rage. Chapter 4-2 As the sound reached his ears, the alchemist froze in place, pressing his back hard against a tree. Crow had heard the fury and chaos, but to him the howl sounded like something worse. There were brass goggles over his eyes, and a dark maroon cloth wrapped around his face, obscuring both nose and mouth. These he pulled off, allowing the cloth to fall to its usual place around his neck. Hungrily, he took a deep breath of clean air. The camp was on the far side of the forest. As such, he could feel the cold breeze coming off the lower veld through the trees. Around the tree trunk, Crow looked toward the still-raging commotion. Then he looked down at the tiny, soot-dusted vial, at the meager bits of bone that remained, trying to understand and process what had just happened. The plan had been to steal back his saddlebags amidst a cover of chaos and of smoke. As they ever had, the bones of the kindling boy worked like a charm. The kiss of an open flame was all it took to create a vast river of liquid smoke. But something else had happened. Something Crow had not expected. Just after the first kindling bone had popped in the fire, he had felt movement in his breast pocket. It must have been the proximity to the fire. The extreme heat had caused an unexpected reaction in the unnatural objects. Panic had thrust him back to his traumatic imprisonment mere hours earlier, choking his very breath away. The seeds had become a writhing ball of vines, growing at an improbable rate. Heart in his throat, Crow had mindlessly seized the thing and hurled it like some hideous spider into the roaring campfire. The men around him had been shouting about the smoke, but quickly those shouts turned to screams. Even for a man of his experience, there were many things in heaven and earth that Tenebrous Crow could not claim to understand. The vampire rose was an exceedingly rare, wholly unnatural thing. The creation of a man's effort to improve upon what nature had made perfect from the start. Until a handful of hours ago, Crow had always given the plant a wide berth. But he had dreamt up plans for those seeds. Vital plans. Something wicked stalked the veld. The creature had earned her death many times over. Unfortunately, such things are not so easily hastened from their perch upon this mortal coil. The seeds of the vampire rose had been vital. Half of a solution to a riddle he had spent nearly a decade trying to solve. The last question. The only question. How do you kill a witch? Thank you for listening to that excerpt from Mark of the Witchworm, read by the author, Steve Van Sampson. Hey, I know that guy. If you like what you've heard, please stay tuned to roughhousepublishing.com and follow us on Facebook. All rights reserved. No part of this recording may be reproduced or utilized in any form without written permission by the author. Stay rough, everybody. And remember, every journey is a damned circle.